that's bright. That is bright. Can you hear me out there? All right. Well, good evening. My name is Mike Vigil. I'm a grateful Christian in recovery for alcohol and sexual integrity. Uh, uh, would you please, please join me in prayer? Oh, Father God, help me. Help me get out of your way, Lord, to be an instrument to be used to show the grace and the love that you shine on my life in this recovery that you've given me for the hope that the hopeless that are out there can find and change their lives too, like you changed mine. In your son's name we pray. Amen. As I said, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and my sobriety date is February 16th of 2004. I also have victory over lust and pornography, and my sobriety date is January 1st of 2017. Yeah. Amen. That, that is a miracle there. I have a sponsor. Uh, who has a sponsor, and I sponsor other men. I have an AA home group, The Meat and Potatoes, that meets on Wednesday nights. I also attend a sexual integrity group uh, on Monday night CR at the same church, uh, First United Methodist on Coronado. I worship and uh, our Lord and Savior at Cape Coral Vineyard Community Church, where I have commitments and also attend small groups on Tuesday nights. But it always wasn't like that. So where do we begin? Well, I was born in 1962 in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, to Beverly and Bob James. I am the oldest of four. You saw them there. My brother and two sisters. Uh, my brother and I being born to our biological father, Bob, uh, who my, my mother divorced when I was three, and my two sisters she had with my stepfather, uh, Charles Vigil. Um, both my biological father and stepfather were Marines, but I grew up only knowing one of them. Uh, that was my pop in the middle of that group of Marines in the middle there and then that second picture. Our biological father never kept in touch with my brother and I, so I only knew one father. He treated me and my brother like one of his own. He also had a son and daughter from a previous marriage, but only his son Chuck came and lived with us uh, when we lived in San Diego where my dad was uh, last stationed. In 1969, he retired and we moved to Florida. You see, my mother had vacation in Clearwater when she was a child, and that is where our destination was to be. Um, we took most of the summer getting here, stopping along the way to visit family and see the sights. But when we arrived in Clearwater, we met up with another family from our old neighborhood in California uh, who were also coming to Florida. Uh, they told my parents about this small town further south called Fort Myers. And after checking it out, my mother said that's where she wanted to live. After a few months in East Fort Myers, they bought a home, in, our first home in Cape Coral, and that's where we settled in. My memories of that time are, are quiet and simple. My brother and sisters and I joined the swim team. We attended church uh, and Sunday school on a weekly basis, and life was good. Then one Saturday afternoon, we were driving by Dolphin Field. Most of you know it now as Jason Bradow Field on Country Club and, and veterans there, but those pictures there that you saw, were that was Dolphin Field. And when we drove by, there was, there was all these peoples in the stands, and they were making noise. I asked my parents what was going on, and it was, it was then that I was first introduced to football. Now, I had seen football on TV, of course, but this was, this was live, and with other kids just like me, they were the ones playing. That year was the last one on the swim team. Football and baseball were my sports from that point on. It was through football and baseball that my family would meet many of our lifelong friends. My pop and one of my coaches hit it off right away, uh, right away as well as his wife and my mom. They had two boys and a daughter who were both uh, all around the same age. We were all separated by about one year. We did everything together, vacations, outings, along with all those sports. And I look back right now and, and I can see how fortunate I was to have the childhood that I had. But with all these things going on, our church life kept dwindling until it was pretty non-existent. The only time we would go to church, it seemed, is when my grandfather would come visiting. And, and though I accepted Jesus into my life when I was about 10, my relationship with him never grew. You see, life got busy. Sound familiar to anybody? Hmm. So without a growing in my relationship with Jesus, I started to grow in the things of this world. Luke 8, 14 says, The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, 
But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. That's what happened to me. One of those things that crowded out the message was pornography. You see, in our neighborhood, like others, uh, us boys had our forts. And in one of those forts, I viewed my first playboy. From there, learning from the other boys in my neighborhood, they told me uh, what they had told me. I found my pop's pornography and thus began the feeding of my first addiction. Now, of course, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. You know, my dad did it. My friends did it. Who was I hurting? And so it became a normal part of my life. Alcohol wasn't much different. My parents drank, their friends drank. It was at every function I can remember. It was part of life. I was introduced to alcohol not by my friends, but by my dad. You see, one of the things we did a lot of was camping, camping out at Fish Eating Creek. If you're familiar with the area, you know it above LaBelle there. My pop and Mr. Ashby would always take most of us kids in the gear and head out early to get a good spot. It was on one of these camping trips, I believe I was about 11 or 12, that I drank my first beer. It wasn't unusual for my pop to have me get him and Mr. Ashby a beer out of the cooler, only this time he told me that Jeff and I, which is Coach Ashby's oldest son, could have one. And so we did. Now I can't tell you that I liked the taste or not, and, and I don't remember how it made me feel. Oh, I do remember how it made me feel. Now, that feeling, it wasn't, it wasn't as buzzed. I might have been buzzed, but I don't remember that. The feeling, the feeling that I felt was that that Bill Wilson describes in his story, uh, that, that moment of arriving, that, that feeling like he belonged. You see, that feeling of drinking a beer with my pop in the woods like a man, well, I felt accepted by the two most influential men in my life at the time. I had arrived. I knew right then that no matter what I would do in life, drinking was going to be part of it. Mikey liked it. <laughs> I had to slip that in somewhere. I managed to do that. <laughs> it wasn't long uh, after that that I would start to show signs of my alcoholism. You see, on the very next camping trip, they let us boys set up our camp just off to the side, sort of our own little camp. And then someone suggested that uh, if we took a few six-packs from one of the many coolers out there, that they would never miss it. So we did. And right away, my mind starts to do the math, right? There's so many beers, and there's so many of us. My brother and the other little ones, well, they only need one. And if I drink fast enough, I can have more. I can have more. That is one of the very first things I identified with uh, when I heard that shared in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The feeling of more. Hmm. And it's only my second time drinking. <laughs> Later that same, day, that same night, I got mad at a friend for accidentally breaking one of my tent poles. And my anger goes straight to rage. And we start fighting. Now this gets the attention of the grown-ups, and we get caught with the beer, and of course, leads to punishment. Now punishment in our household was always the same. Okay, uh, that's one thing about having a a Marine, I guess, for a pop. Uh, it was the same thing. You went to your room, you thought about what you had done, dad would come in and talk about it, and then came the whooping. Okay? Again, always the same. Drop your drawers, grab your ankles, 10 licks, 15 licks, whatever, whatever he felt fit the wrong. So needless to say, I got a pretty good whooping when we got back from camping that time. <clears throat> and, and I would like to tell you that I saw the negative impact that, of alcohol in that situation but I didn't. That would not happen for another 30 years. <laughs> My drinking started to go hand in hand with everything I did from that moment on. In high school, it started to become more and more a part of my life. But of course, it had nothing to do with the decline in my grades or how I practiced and performed on the football field. In fact, in my eyes, I was on the honor roll and I was the best football player in the area. Can you say delusional? <laughs> Just a little bit. You see, this delusional, self-centered thinking became the norm of my life. It leads to my short college career, one semester at South Florida in Tampa. I would later, later blame my failure on the fact that the college and the bars in the area made it so cheap and easy to drink. It was their fault. Well, with all the drink specials every night of the week, how could I be expected 
to make every class, right? So I didn't. I returned home from Christmas break and never returned. With no other prospects, my dad said to get, get a job. So I went, back to the, I went back to the summer job I had before college, an iron worker. And although, although it was a hard and physical job, I loved it. You see, no one messed with the iron workers. And that fit into the persona I wanted to project to others. And, of course, there was the drinking. You know, most of, most of the work at that time in the, in the 80s, the early 80s, was down in Naples and Fort Myers Beach and Marco. And the first thing we did before driving home was stop and get the beer. Again, drinking was part of everything I was doing. Along with the tough image of being an eye worker, I played rugby for a local club. I loved the game, but what I liked most was the drinking. If anybody's been to a, a, a rugby match and a party afterwards, you know what I'm talking about, but we won't go there. Now, during this time, I also been seeing a girl I met over the summer. She was uh, uh, two years older than I and going to Edison and was the person who introduced me to rugby. The most important thing, though, about her was that she liked to drink, too. But because, of, because I started drinking so young and having a delusional, self-centered character directing that thinking, I never really grew up, and I made some bad decisions. When she told me she was pregnant, I played it like I would do the right thing by her, but never followed through. She would end up turning to someone else uh, for help and comfort. I, in turn, blamed her for the breakup. I couldn't see my wronging of her in this situation. How dare she leave me? I blamed her for the emptiness I felt. Can you say selfish? I can now, but back, <laughs> I can now, but back then, everything was everyone else's fault. Now, this would be the pattern I would follow for the next 20 years or so. Relationship after relationship, job after job. Everyone had a part in all my demises but me. After each failed relationship or job, most lasting only a couple of years, I would pick myself up and drive on. My pop, the Marine, had instilled in me that never give up, never surrender, John Wayne can-do attitude. And so in my mind, I would always prevail until I hit bottom. You see, I never thought that my drinking or use of pornography had warped my thinking in situations and relationships with others. But when all you've ever been is a scared little boy who never grew up, that never give up, never surrender attitude starts to fade and crack. I know because in 2003, at the age of 41, I started to contemplate a thought I could never comprehend in others. You see, I can never understand what could be so wrong in someone's life that you would want to kill themselves. I had just lost a job I had spent months working to get back. I failed again, and this time, I didn't want to get up. What's the point, I thought. But worst of all, no matter how much I drank or how much I drugged, I couldn't stop feeling this way. The alcohol stopped doing what it had always done, changed my perception of reality, and made it all right to be me. And if it's not okay to be me, then again, what's the point? So that's where the thought of not waking up started sounding good. So I planned it and tried to carry it out. But as you can see, I failed again. Thank you, Jesus. Now the next morning, found me, I found myself at my mother's on her couch. Now besides having probably one of the worst hangers I ever had, all I can remember feeling was this sense of whatever. You know, I give up. I, I don't know what to do from here. So when my mother came back after dropping me off from my apartment with an old friend of the family, I figured they were going to Baker Act me and take me to see a doctor, right? That's what you do. But instead, Aunt Susie, the old friend, she asked if I wanted to tell her what was going on. And so I did. I proceeded to tell her how crappy my life was and what happened and what this and that. And after I was done spewing out all the crap on her, she asked me one very simple question. Have you had enough? You know, it was like a light bulb going off. Yes, yes, I had had enough of this kind of life. But then she asked me if I wanted to go to an AA meeting. Yeah, I wasn't ready for that one. You know? But it sounded better than going to the shrink, so I said yes. So I said yes. <laughs> I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that afternoon, and I've been going ever since. You see, 
I got into detox that afternoon, spent five days detoxing. And in there, they told me to go to meetings, get a sponsor, and work these things called steps. Now, I didn't know anything about alcohol, being an alcoholic and wasn't sure if I was one. I did know one thing for certain. I didn't want to go back to the way it was. I was done with that life. When they said I should get on my knees in the morning and pray to stay sober to whatever God I could believe in, I did. And then thanked him at night for keeping me sober. I really didn't know what I believed in at that time when it came to God. But they said pray, and so I did. I also started to read about God in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And with the help of a sponsor and others and working through these steps, something happened. Something they said they needed to happen if I was going to stay sober. Change. Mostly in my selfish thinking and how I saw things. Romans 12 verse 2 tells us this will happen. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It started with my powerlessness over alcohol and seeing how that had made my life unmanageable. Now, I could see how unmanageable my, my life was, but this whole notion of being powerless over anything, let alone alcohol, well, I couldn't see that. But my sponsor could. You see, he had been listening all along as I shared with him how I drank, when I drank, and how much I drank. How sometimes I would say to myself, I'm not going to drink today. I'll take a break. I have some things that I have to do. And then by the afternoon, well, maybe I'll stop in for just one or two, you know, be on my way. And would end up being there till closing time. Or how so sometimes when I drank, there was no stopping. It was through thinking about, thinking about and discussing it with my sponsor that I began to see my powerlessness over alcohol. Countless times, going all the way back to those camping days, I could never control the amount of alcohol I drank, which led to all kinds of decisions that left my life unmanageable. With that, he told me to fire myself as manager of my life and get a new one. Now, at first, it was a group of drunks, G-O-D, right? We love acrostics here at Celebrate Recovery. That was my very first one, G-O-D, group of drunks, and it was my home group. Then, and then I, a God of my own understanding, a God I came up with, which turned out to be very limited. <laughs> with that, I, can, I continued through the steps, though. And it was only by writing out my fourth step, then sharing it with my sponsor, that I was able to start seeing the person I really was. There was a lot I didn't like. One of the first things we worked on was my honesty. So I had to practice being honest. Sounds easy enough, right? Turns out I would lie about the littlest things, things, things that didn't really matter. But if I thought you wouldn't like the truth, I would lie and tell you what I thought you would like, and therefore you would like me. By practicing honesty, I found I didn't have to track the lies that I had told. What a concept, huh? And what a freedom it was. It's, it's the, that's one of the best gifts I've, I've received through here. This also, this also helped tremendously in making my eight-step list and followed by the amends on that list. Here is is where I really began to see the results of trusting the process, as we say here. The positive feedback I received from people I was sure hated me fueled my, my desire for more. More of the things they said I could have, like being happy, joyous, and free. Now, at the same time, I continued to say yes whenever asked. And one of those things was a retreat on the river with other men. Hmm. Now, some, that's something I'd never done before and wasn't sure if that was for me, right? I, that, that wasn't me. But it was something that the men around me in my recovery did to grow spiritually. So again, I said yes. I continued to do these retreats over the next couple years. And as I spent time with some of these men, I began to see the limits of the God, as I said, what I called Mike's limited understanding. You see, their higher power was Jesus but not the Jesus I ever knew. So at the end of one of these treats, as we shared what each of us had gotten out of the weekend, I stated that I wanted to know this Jesus I'd have been hearing all about. From there, one of the men there gave me a book that changed how I felt this, about this person named Jesus. 
The book is more than a carpenter. Now, as we got together and discussed the book, I said the sinner's prayer with him and rededicated my life to Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I can tell you, my life, as well as my recovery, has never been the same. Thank you. Shortly, short, shortly after this, he invited me to a Bible study he was in with some other men in recovery. And like the study, like the studying of the big book in AA for my alcoholism, I would need to study the, the big, big book for my walk as a Christian. And like a home group in AA, I, was, I would need a, to find a church for service, fellowship, and accountability. He related this to all the things I already was familiar with in my AA recovery, and that made sense for me, and I could, I could grasp to that. A few months later, he sponsored me, as you saw, on a walk to Emmaus. This really opened my eyes and heart to what it is to be a child of God and set in motion a new way of life in my recovery. I was then able to experience serving on Emmaus walks as well as going into the prisons with the Kairos ministry. This ministry showed me the power of the Holy Spirit like I had never experienced it before. To witness hardened hearts melted, 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 melted by the power of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ will be something I will never, ever forget. I thought this is what I'm called to do. I really was. But he had other plans. He had other plans. He always does. See, almost five years ago, my sponsor and mentor asked me and the other men in our Bible study if we would be interested in starting and serving in a new Celebrate Recovery ministry. Yeah. Now, I wasn't quite sure, not knowing that much about CR, but I, but I did know I didn't want to miss out on what God would do in this ministry. And boy, was I right. Boy, was I right. You see, from the time we started training in August of 2013 to where we are now has been the right of a lifetime. Where once there was only about 10 or 15 of us, no band, and only two groups, A to Z, we're now averaging 70 to 100. We have four solid groups and growing. A worship band with musicians from several area churches. And we are now into our fifth step study. But the real honor and privilege has been to witness the lives changed and restored by this process we have in Celebrate Recovery. These steps work when you work them. I know, I'm living proof, as are so many else of us in this room. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So, so if you're new or coming back, don't give up until the miracle happens. Don't give up. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, The temptations of your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. <laughs> Excuse me. You are not alone. Just keep coming back. My name is Mike Vigil. I'm a child of God and person of worst. Thank you and God bless. <laughs>